Hey, so listen, is, is it okay if we just get real this morning? You know, I've been trying to keep my, my messages a little tighter, so I'm just going to get right into it. Yeah, is that cool? I'm just going to get, get, all right, so get, get, so can somebody say get real? I don't know if you're ready. I, I, I know Andrea's ready. I'm not, can somebody say get real? So here's the deal. Listen, we're going to talk about some generosity, some finances, and things like that. We're just going to get real. Generosity is more than your money, but it's not less than your money. You with me? Last week, we did a foundational message to this series that we're doing called uh, Generous Jesus, and it, it gave a holistic approach to generous living. Your time, your talents, and your treasure. And we didn't really go down any one of those lanes too deep. We just said, hey, man, this is what it looks like. We look at Jesus. We believe that the more we behold generous Jesus, the more that that we actually will become like that. You know, like we can be generous with our words. We can be generous with our vulnerability. We can be generous with our time. But it's not less than our finances. Like our our money actually matters. And so we're going to get real, right? We're going to get real. Okay, so listen. We're going to get real because money's a big deal to us, isn't it? I mean, it's a big deal. It affects relationships. It affects your mood. If, like right now, if on your phone, your money app said that um, uh, radical fraud has occurred to your bank account and there's nothing left until you do something about it, you'd be gone. You'd be like, I'll catch this you know, online. <laughs> I got to go take care of it. If you had incredible financial gain, all of a sudden you'd be like, Yeah. Let's go. This is amazing. It affects marriages and relations. We got Jerry and Liz over here who, who lead our relational harmony. I mean, is it true that, that money is, is a big, big factor? And absolutely. Like, we got we to get on the same page. Like, money has weight um, in our lives. You see, money is really a big deal to Jesus, too. Did you know that? You see, because we're a big deal to Jesus, so what's a big deal to us is a big deal to Jesus. And because money affects us so deeply, Jesus taught about it a lot. Like, you would probably be surprised how many of the actual verses that are recorded in the Bible go to it. So I was on, you you can get different stats on this. I was on uh, preachingtoday.com, and they said that, like, there's 288 verses just from Jesus on the issue of your finances. 16 of his 38 parables deal with how you steward your your stuff. It's it's such a big deal to him that, that he gets... Real. Somebody say, get real. He gets real with this. Check this verse out. He, he basically says this. I'm going to give you a prelude to it. Can we get that verse, please? Here's a prelude. You can either be about stuff or God. That's what life comes down to. You've got two choices. We'll use Jesus' words. They're much better. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You just can't do it. Y'all know this, right? I mean, how many of you think you're a really good multitasker? Now listen, I know it's Mother's Day coming up, and I know mothers, like days, plural, are full of multitasking, right? But you're usually at your best when you're fully present with the task at hand, true? Jesus was way ahead of this. He knew this. He's like, you can either be about God or stuff, period. That's, that's your life choice. And so if we're going to get real this morning, we're just going to get after it. What do you want to be about? God or stuff? Like, better phrased, what's your greater yes? What's your greater yes when it comes to God or stuff? Because Jesus really only gives us those two options. So listen, today I'm going to introduce you to uh, uh, somewhat of what I would consider a secret weapon to helping you um, get to your greater yes. Because I'm just imagining, I'm taking a wild guess that most of you here this morning, or if you're listening online, what's up online people? Good to see you. Even if you're listening on like a Thursday evening, hey, hey, what's up? Thanks for checking us out. Um, You probably want to be about God. You probably don't want to come to the end of your life and be like known for, man, 
this woman was an amazing gatherer of stuff. Most of us are probably not after that. What an amazing dad. He gave me a lot of stuff. It's probably not what you want to be about. So I'm just guessing that your greater yes, if you're only given two options, which according to Jesus, that's it, is, is I'd, rather be, I'd rather be about God. I'd rather, I'd rather be chasing after God than, than stuff. So today, I think I got a secret. When I, in our family, we don't we try not to keep secrets. We're like, no, no secrets. So maybe I should call it a surprise. <laughs> That's what we do. We got a surprise. Don't tell your mom. We got a surprise weapon in helping you with your greater yes. You guys want to hear about it? Yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. First of all, let's do, let's do a couple of things. Let's lay a foundation. Let's talk about the formula. And then we're going to spend hopefully a lot, well, most of our time, if I do this well enough, on the first step on the first step there. Because we've already laid the foundation, we've already talked about the formula. That was last week. Was anybody here last week? Anybody here? Okay, if you weren't here last week, please go back and listen to last week. It lays a foundation uh, for, for what, we're, what we're trying to do here. And, and so, last week we talked about our foundation being Generous Jesus, the name of uh, the series. And we said that by beholding Jesus, this is a, a, a spiritual principle, we actually become more and more like him. When we behold him in the right way, as our treasure, and we start to see him in all of life. And so as we behold generous Jesus, we looked at 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. It's given in the context of Paul writing to a church in Corinth, saying, hey, fulfill, that, fulfill the gift that you promised these churches that are living below their means. Like, help them. You said you were going to help them. And then he uses this as motivation. This is our foundation for, for generous living. It's Jesus. And it says this, that, that Jesus, although he was rich because he was with the Father, before he put on human clothes, he was crazy rich because you can't compare the spiritual blessings of unending fellowship with the Father with anything you can get here. Plus, the scriptures tell us he's the creator and sustainer. He owns it all. He was crazy rich. What did he do with his riches? Yet for your sake, he became poor. So he put on humanity, lived among us, was sinless, but was surrounded by sin so much so that when he went to the cross, he then owned our sin. It was as if Christ lusted after other women when he was married. It was as if Christ was abusive. It was as if Christ went back out in his addiction. It was as if Christ, fill in the blank, whatever, whatever defines you, Jesus is like, that, that's mine. Father, crush me so you don't have to crush them. That's where his poverty led him. But we know that on the third day, it was just a borrowed grave. It was a, it was a means to an end. And so we're not just people of the cross, we're people of the resurrection, which says because Christ overcame and paid for our sins completely, we now get to join him in overcoming sin, being forgiven and given a new life if we simply believe and receive his work on our behalf. That's the gospel message, that you come as you are, but God never leaves you as he found you. We become rich like Christ we inherit all the spiritual blessings that Christ had and has. That's our foundation for generosity. Tim Keller in his message, Radical Generosity, says, if, if you want to like, know how you should give in the New Testament, it's according to the gospel. That's our litmus for how we should give. All right, well, what's the formula? The formula is laying up treasures. Jesus tells us in, in Matthew 6 that we are to be about, as his people, treasure hunting and gathering. And so he has no problem with treasure. He's just all about location, location, location. Make sure that your treasure is in a place where it's actually safe and meaningful and will do something for you. Don't spend yourself trying to gather stuff here where moth and rust and time and ourselves destroy it. Make sure you lay it up in a place that matters and is safe. And then he goes on to say this. He says, now check this out. 
where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. Jesus knew me. He knew me. I love stuff and what stuff does for me. And if left to my own devices, I will chase after stuff. I mean, you might not think, oh, well, like he's a money grubbing, blah, blah, blah. But I love the comfort that stuff brings, and so I'll get just enough stuff to get my comfort, but make sure that like, I, like, I look good in your eyes, too. Like, that's, that's my heart. My heart's like one of, one of my daughter's favorite stuff. She loves slime. I have a seven-year-old daughter. She loves, like, literally, you buy slime. She knows how to make it from YouTube. She's like, I don't, she, she's like, you know, you could, there's going to be, like, some sort of, like, YouTube about her or something. She's got glue activator, baking powder, and shampoo. And she's like, I don't know what kind of racket she's running, but then all of a sudden, it's like, slush like, here, face, oh, isn't that satisfying, Daddy? <laughs> and it's like, the problem is right now, slime's outlawed in my house. You know why? Because my wife's like, you can't handle it. It ends up getting everywhere. That's, the, that's my heart. I can't handle it. I cannot handle my heart. It is slimy and gets everywhere. And so Jesus is like, I got you. Just make sure your treasure's in the right place because your heart will follow. Quit trying to think your heart's in the right place. Get your treasure in the right place because your heart's going heart's gonna to follow. Well, I'm doing okay. We're on first steps. All right, all right, first steps. First steps is what we're looking at today as being a, a first fruits mentality. So what we're going to do here is we're going to explore some things that were going on in the Old Testament and see how they show up in our lives today. So, so some first fruits, first fruits. There was, there's two concepts that I'm going to explain to you, and then, and then we're going to see here uh, in, in the scriptures um, that, that the God's people were commanded to do. First fruits and tithing, they're two different things, but we're going to look at them both and we're going to say, well, what's a first fruits mentality? First of all, the idea of first fruits, this was an agricultural society in the Old Testament, God's people. They lived from the land, on the land. And so what God would tell them was, and this is coming in Exodus, right when they got freed from slavery. You remember that song we just sang? I'm no longer... Like, he split the seas. That reminds us of how God rescued his people out of slavery. And as they're coming in to the promised land, in Exodus, this is, this is, he's like, listen, you've exited one thing, and I'm going to set you up to succeed in this new life. But here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to, to give me the first fruits of the ground that, that your crops produce. So whether it was like animals and sheep and things like that, or it was actual fruit, or it was actual grain, whatever, um, as it starts to come in, I want you at the very onset to come and give me a portion of what comes in. It's going gonna, it's gonna to like keep you tied to me. It's going to remind you that it all belongs to me and, and that, that I'm good and that you can trust me. You don't, I don't need the whole thing. I just I want a portion of the first fruits that, that come in uh, because that's going to actually help to set your heart in the right space. All right. The second thing, if we can see the next verse, please. Honor the Lord. Um, no, go back one more. Yeah, perfect. Honor the Lord with your wealth, okay, all the stuff they had, and with the first fruits of all your produce. Okay, so, so here we see this, the same principle at play, that, that what you do first with your money matters. Now we get to tithing. Let's see the second one. Next one, yeah, perfect. Every tithe which means 10%, every tithe of the land, okay, they're still an agricultural culture, that, that's, that's how they made their living, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees is the Lord's. It is holy, which means set apart to the Lord. So we've got two different things happening here. We've got the first fruits that's like, oh my goodness, my crop is starting to grow I'm going to bring in the produce and the, and the proceeds that come from this. I'm going to bring a portion of it into the Lord. And then we have the second concept of tithing, which is like all of your stuff. God says, bring in 
of all of your stuff so that you can remember. I, like, I'm, I'm your God. I brought you out of slavery. I, I've given you all this. You used to be in chains, bro, remember? And now you're living in somebody else's land. I took care of you, and what I want you to do is I want you to trust me with, with a little bit of it. You, I, I, you, don't, you don't need to give me 50%. You don't need to give me 100 I want you to trust me because we've got a relationship going on here with 10%. And, I, and, and I actually, I actually like you to begin trusting me first and then setting life accordingly after. And that's what we're looking at today is a first fruit mentality. Here's what it is. Is devoting to God first a tithe, 10% of all that comes in financially. So we all have different jobs. We all make different amounts of money. We're all in different seasons of life. But the logic here, because I'm going to talk a little bit about logic and logistics, and then we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to push even a little further. The logic of this is this. Like, if we could just reason for a second, if my heart, for, first of all, logically, you have to either believe the Bible or not. Like, if you don't believe the Bible, then this doesn't make sense. So that's cool. We still love you. Keep exploring with us. But if you believe the Bible is God's word, then you have to believe that wherever my treasure is, what's going to follow it? My, my heart. Okay, because it's like that's just logically what Jesus says. So logically, when we think about a first fruits mentality, okay, we take the idea of first fruits at the beginning. I'm going to start off this way. Well, how much? What should I do? Well, I'll use the concept of the tithe that God taught his people in the Old Testament to be my guide here. Well, so I'm going to first start off with like, like it all belongs to you and I want to honor you in it. And, and this is the amount that I'm going to bring in, 10% of what I make. It's going to be my first step towards logically securing my heart in a good spot. Now, is it true that if you tithe, your heart can still be slimy? Yes. The Pharisees were great at this, right? Like, you can still get this right and get it all wrong. Understand that this isn't like a foolproof thing, but I believe that this is certainly a secret and even a surprise weapon that we don't talk about enough in the church that will actually help move you in a much healthier place than you've ever been when it comes to seeing your heart in the right spot. First fruits mentality. Take care of your treasure, your heart will follow. All right, well, if that's the logic uh, behind it, tell me something different, because I'm not, you know, like, I'm not usually the most logical guy, right? If you know me, I'm like a feeler, I'm this, I'm that, I'm just kind of trying to like, you know, you know, I'm not hopefully just kind of led all by feelings, but logic makes sense to me, but I need a little something more. Check this out. Malachi, verse 3, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 10. This is the prophet writing on behalf of the Lord. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. All right, so here's the deal. Now we're moving from logic to relationship. Why would you want to adopt a first fruits mentality? Well, number one, because you got slimy hearts. That's just logical. Number two is because, like, the Lord loves you. The Lord is in love with you. The Lord has set his best for you in Christ and clothed you with all salvation through his finished work. He has added to that the place where you live, the food that you eat, the relationships that you have. And here's what he's saying. What's best for you in your life right now is that you love me most. I'm going to tell you what's absolutely best for you in your life right now, that you pursue me. And when you adopt a first fruits mentality, you actually start to experience obedience. You start to experience trust. And you start to experience that God is a God of his word. 
This kind of language is not like do it or else. This kind of language, he says, test me. Come on, see what I'm made of. My kids, my little guys, they're always like, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? I'm like, I just got, I pick them up from school. I'm like, how was your day? No response, eh, it's fine. What are we doing? Like, what's going on? I'm like, you should ask me about how my day was. How was your day? Fine, okay, what are we doing? What are we, they always, they always want to know. And, and, and so when I don't tell them or I don't know, they get frustrated and they get kind of like upset with me and they get impatient. And, and here's, here's my invitation to them. Am I not good? Do we not normally have an awesome time together? Can't you trust me? You see, I, I, I'm asking them based on the nature of our relationship to trust me with their time, which is really all they have because they, they don't have much. God is asking us uh, on the nature of who he is to bring the full tithe. And watch what he does. So we're going to break this down here just a little bit, and, and we're going we're to get the logistics of first fruits uh, mentality. Okay, so who? Who does the tithe go to? Well, the tithe goes first and foremost to the Lord. He says, test me. Right? So when we start thinking about 10% of all that we make going somewhere, first and foremost, we tithe unto the Lord. This is about you and God. This is, this is about you understanding and actually believing and leaning into the relationship that you are so good. I love you so much, and I want to actually respond in a tangible way to what you're asking of me. It goes to the Lord. That's our attitude about the tithe. You see, and here's what that does. It relieves you from having to like be like over scrutinous about the potential church it might go to. We're going to talk about that in a second. But you'd be like, I don't love everything that church does. They're not getting all my time. Well, it's to the Lord. That's like me saying, well, I don't love everything my wife does. I'm not going to love her like Christ loves a church. Not until she fixes I'm going to go back, back over here to Jerry and Liz. That's probably not the right attitude, right? <laughs> Relationally. I got my foot on the thing. I don't know. I was like, I'm out, I'm out of line, right? It's like, I love you, Jesus. And although she may or may not be meeting some sort of like standards of expectations or what I thought it was going to be, this is about me loving you, Jesus, through, through the way I love her. Tithing is to the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't, like, know the local church. That We're going to talk about what, where it goes, but know the local church. What are they doing? You can look at their budget. Absolutely. I'm just saying that's not the primary place. It goes from your heart to his. Okay, so that's the who, but, but what about the what? Well, Malachi says bring in the full tithe. So it's cool if we get real, right? Well, I know John. It's cool with John. So, so this, is, this is the full tithe is on gross. Remember, it's a first fruits mentality. It's not like after I pay my taxes and I pay my mortgage and I pay my insurance, I'm going to tithe on what's left. That would be like a third fruit mentality, right? If we're keeping it real. A, a first fruits mentality is like, God, this is what you've given me. Here's my, here's my salary. This, this is what it is. Or if you're, you know, maybe you don't work off a salary. Maybe it's up and down. That's cool. So you, you walk with your up and down. It's like, God, this is what you're bringing me, and first fruits, man. I love you. I know you love me. I'm scared. But I know you've never failed me. Gross. It's the full tithe. It's the full tithe. That's what we're talking about here. Well, and then, and then why? Why would, we, why would we do this? I love, I was, again, I mentioned Tim Keller in his sermon, Radical Generosity. He was talking about like the early Christians, and one of the ways like the church grew, obviously it was the Spirit of God and the Word of God, but was through the radical generosity of the early church. Like people just thought they were crazy because they didn't have a ton, but they were like so open-handed with like everything they had. It grew like lightning was the word he kept using through the Roman Empire, which wasn't that culture. So why would we, I mean... 
Look at the world today. What might they think of God's people? If we became most known for like our radical generosity based on the gospel. Why? Well, Malachi gives us some more specifics as, as to, the, to the why. He says that there would be food in my house. So he's talking about the temple and the operation and mission of God. So, so like God had a, he, his mission was the rescue and renewal of all creation. It's the same mission, Old and New Testament, but it just had different, like some different um, expressions. Old Testament, it was like, we're gonna build this sweet temple and y'all are gonna come. And when you get here, this is where the presence of God is. And you're gonna be like, oh, gonna be awesome. New Testament, Jesus is like, okay, change the plans. Not really, he knew the plan, but new plan. You ready? Here we go. Yeah, yeah, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? We're gonna build it even bigger. We got better materials. Oh, it's gonna be the biggest mega church in Jerusalem. It's gonna be awesome, right, Jesus? He's like, no, check this out. I'm gonna take the treasure of heaven and like my very, my, my, which is me and my spirit, it's called the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna put it in you. And then rather than inviting people to come to this big, super shiny thing, I'm going to send you. And you're going to be like the big, broken, but beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's a much more like aggressive mission. Like we're going to go to all the nations. Now, Old Testament, it was, they were to be a blessing to bless all the nations. So again, same mission. But now Jesus is like, we got to get. We got to send. We got to equip. We got to plant churches. It's, a, it's like a more aggressive call in the New Testament than the Old. And so that's why we're talking about this as being a first step. Because if in the Old Testament, where they didn't even under, fully understand the gospel, they knew like there's a, there's a Messiah coming and I'm going to trust for that. Now we've got everything. we got Christ. We know the full story. How much more should we be generous? If back here it was like 10%. Here, it's like that's a great first step. It's a great first step. But remember, our giving is in accordance with the gospel. It's a great first step. All right, so listen. I want to talk to you a little bit about the lifestyle. The lifestyle. So what to expect. All right, so, so this is probably where maybe some damage has been done in your history. If you've been around church, maybe, potentially. Maybe you're like, oh, this guy's asking for my money. This, I, I don't, man, you told me this church wasn't like that. <laughs> listen, listen. Just hang around long enough. I don't need, I'm not going to justify how our church does things here. Hang around long enough and make your own decision on that, okay? And, and see if that's really what you think is happening here. Because God... <laughs> God doesn't need your money, okay? Like when I, when I ask my child for a few fries, I, I don't need the fries. I go get my own fries. I gave you the fries. <laughs> but, but maybe it's really good for my little eight-year-old to, to learn to start to live like this, right? Maybe it's actually more about her and him and their heart and it is what I need. I heard that fry example years ago. I love it. There was one service, I don't know if you were in here a couple years ago, I brought French fries in. We poured them out. It was pretty, it was pretty awesome. So the lifestyle, what can we expect? I mean, you're talking about a blessing, right? So this means I'm going to get paid, right? I start tithing, I'm going to be like, woo, come on, Lord. I'm ready for you to open the storehouse and bring it down. No. No. By the way, don't cut that portion out and then like post it as a bad, okay? No. At least before I say no. Because sometimes you need a blessing of financial increase, right? Sometimes you actually need more money. But a lot of times you need more peace that money can't buy. A lot of times you need healing that money can't buy. A lot of times you need reconciliation. So if we want to talk about a blessing, a lot of times you just need the presence of Christ more demonstrated and experienced in your life. There's no bigger blessing than that. So this isn't like we give 
to get more money. But there, I'm, I'm just going to leave this portion here. There is something where the father's like, come on. Test me. See what happens. Okay? Lifestyle. So I'm going to give you a little, little brief testimony and then, and then some steps and we're out. Ready? The lifestyle. Pour down a blessing. So I don't know how old I was. He's here. I had the conversation with my dad. I was, I was like a young pup, like, I don't know, 10, 11, whatever, 13. And, and I remember we started talking about tithing, which is already a win, parents. If you're having a conversation with your young child about tithing, it's a win. Let me just tell you that right now. Okay. And so uh, I was like, you know, hey, I don't know if you remember this dad. I was like, hey, does your dad tithe? And what about you? And so we, we were talking about tithing and, and, um, for whatever reason, and I'm just going to blame the Spirit of God, I got into, like, wanting to tithe. And here's what I thought. Here was my thought. I'm like, I don't know if I'm getting a lot of this other stuff right. Like, love your neighbor as yourself. What does that even mean? I don't know if I'm doing it right. I can get this right. I know what obedience looks like here. I can do the math, and I can bring this to the Lord. And for whatever reason, as a young pup, it became a thing in my life. And I just want to give you a little bit of a brief testimony of how God, I believe, used that thing because he was actually showing it to me this week. And that's why part of this message is entitled The Secret Weapon. Because I didn't know how much of my life has been formed by this obedience. So, so here's what he showed me. Sexual purity. Here's the thing. I started tithing young, you know, and I was just, I'm tithing, I'm tithing, I'm doing it. Like, this is on me. It's not because, like, I'm doing it. And, and God gifted me a spirit of wanting to give gifts back to him. Does that make sense? Some of you are really good at giving gifts. You love giving gifts to people. It, like, amps you up, right? You're like, whoo I got some money. I'm going to go buy this for this. For whatever reason, God made me like that to him. And, and I believe that's the blessing that he's poured out on me. And, the, and one of the first places it, it manifested itself was in my sexual purity. So I'm dating. I'm like your typical teenage guy, and I would love to and like enjoy sex with my girlfriend. And then this girlfriend, well, you know, like I'm just like a guy, right? It's just kind of part of the thing. And then I make my, meet my wife. But, but, but along the way, from, from like a, a, an early age in my dating, I don't know if you can call it a dating career, dating journey, that's probably better, <laughs> I don't, I don't think career is going to work, but dating journey, it was like, no. This, I'm saving for him. It was hard. It was costly. But like God was giving me this spirit of like, I want to I wanna give you things. And, and so one of the first places that it really showed up and was an amazing blessing to me that took me out of worrying about like STDs, unwanted pregnancies, this, that, spiritual union before marriage, and then trying to work that out. I was like, I, I want to give this to you. And I, and I believe that God revealed to me this week that a lot of that came from, from the blessing he was pouring out on me from giving my 10% and my heart was in the right place. Secondly, a worship mindset. So I have this crazy idea, and I've had it since I've been a young pup too, that all of life is worship, and you're either in full-time ministry or you don't know Jesus. I know that may sound like weird to you or whatever. I just think that if you believe in, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've received him, which by the way, if you haven't, believe in the Lord Jesus today. He's just that good that he's calling you to himself through a message on, on first fruits mentality. But, but like I just, as, as he, like I said, young guy, I'm coming up. I believe that all of life is worship. So this is a worship service, but I'm almost afraid to call it that because you think the worship service ends in about, you know, five minutes if I'm doing well. And then you go out and do something else. But God gave me this spirit that was like, I want to give you all of life. 
So every moment matters. The moments when we have a discussion after, me leaning in, me asking well-informed questions, me praying for you, me giving you a hug, that's worship unto the Lord. Just like it is me trying to do my best to like preach the passage, just like it will be when I go home and my little guy wants to run routes. Okay, you can hit the tree and go left. All right, boom, I'm gonna hit it. I'm gonna be fully present then. And then when I'm with my wife, we're like, oh my goodness, we did another day. Pound it out, baby. Whew, we're so tired. But what about you? How you doing? Oh, you know what? I know you don't like sitting in a house that's messy. Lord Jesus, this is for you. I'm just to clean this up. I don't want to clean it up. That's not really that as important to me as it is to her. Here's what God did, though. Listen, it's what he did. He, like, gave me this spirit of wanting to give him things in the midst of all of life. I couldn't have figured that out as a 13-year-old. I couldn't. Lastly, foster care. So I was like, God told me at this conference we were at, I want you to foster and then adopt out of foster care. And I didn't approach that moment like, ah, now I got to do this. I was like, (laughs) this is going to be awesome. Lord, Lord, this is going to be for you. It's going to be for you. It's going to be for you. I don't get there on my own. I looked, what, how can I, what do I attribute this to? The word of God, teaching, community, all these things. But there was this thing I was doing all the time, which kept putting my heart in the right spot. The blessing for me was that God somehow made me want to give him stuff. And it's like resulted in a lot of joy. And I think God's used it. So I met my wife, and she was new in the faith by the time we got married. I actually met her before she was a believer. Probably should have had somebody tell me, eh, she probably pumped the brakes on that one. I keep looking over at Jerry and Liz on that. Where were you, Jerry and Liz? I needed you. But God, you know, being good. So we get married. She comes to faith. And I was like, okay, move forward. She's like, wait, 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 wait. We're talking about 10% of everything? Or, like, that's, that's kind of like a lot of money, you know? But for me, because I had been doing it with like 10 bucks and 100 bucks and 1,000 bucks, by the time I was making like whatever like your first job makes, it was like, of course. But when, you, when you're starting from scratch, you're like, what? I don't, that's a lot. And so God did a really cool work on her, but I just think some of you might be here like, what? That's like a lot of money. All right, so this is where we end, right? First steps to your first step. Because sometimes you need to take like a first step before you take your official first step, right? Here they are. Start with the love of God. Romans 8, 1 says this. There is, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's where you gotta start. You wanna take a first step towards first fruits mentality and tithing? This is where you gotta start. There's no condemnation whether you you do it or you don't. I'm not saying just kind of live how you want. I'm just saying that Christ took all the condemnation that will ever come your way. So you want to start from a place of love that drives obedience, not, well, I have to earn something from God, and so that's why I'm going to do it. Step two, define reality. What percent are you giving right now? So, So think about that. Old Testament went to the temple. New Testament, our understanding is that it should go to the local church, whatever local church you call your home church, because that's God's plan A for the mission of God. So just think maybe the last month or the last year, what percent have you given to, whether it's the Avenue Church or Journey Church or Spanish River Church, wherever you might be? All right, this is where I am. Okay, what do we do then? What do we do then? Well, then we repeat step one. (laughs) Ha ha! Gotcha! Because now you're like either mad at me, maybe you've already got mad at me, that's cool. Or you're like, well, well just, just go back to step one. Or maybe you start beating yourself up. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. What shall we say about these things? Verse 31 of chapter 8 in Romans. If God is for us, who can be against us? If he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he also with him not graciously give us all 
things. Step three, question reality. So ask yourself, once you get that percentage of what you're actually giving, ask yourself, does that reflect my greater yes? Remember, we're getting real, right? It's okay. Let's get real. That's how we get better. Does, does this percentage reflect where this message started on, my, on my, greater, my greater yes? God gives me, he doesn't leave me clueless. He's like, let's start with 10%. So, so what, what's reflecting in the midst of that? Repeat step one. Repeat step one. That's an actual step. Can you see it? Do I have a screen? Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Boom. Okay. All right. I'm still in Romans 8. I wish I grabbed my bigger print Bible. <laughs> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or maybe not being where you want to be in this area? It's not going to separate you. God loves you right where you are. Right where you are. No matter what emotion you're experiencing right now based on these questions. God's like, that's, if you're in Christ, he's like, that's mine. If you're not in Christ, He's like, come, kill me here. Off you. Next step, I think it's step five. Or I don't know, you can do the math. Change reality. Change reality. How do you change reality as it pertains to like your greater yes? And how do you how do you like start to use this secret weapon more? We just make a plan. So if we're, if we're say right here, and you're like, yeah, I'm actually, I actually have a leaning towards this, like, like God's grace to me is doing something to where I can see I'd, like to, I'd love to be a part of this. But, but like I am in a situation right now where there's no way I could just go from what I give to 10%. That's cool. Make a plan. Like make a plan. You don't, you don't right? When you, when you go, like you want to shift something physically, you don't try to lose like 35 pounds in a week, Right? You don't try to put muscle on like in two months. You plan it out and work towards it. So, so make a plan. So if you, if you question, I'm sorry, if you defined reality and you're like, you know what, I give about 1%. Okay, there's no condemnation. Well, and I'm hearing 10%. I'd love to work to that. God, I'd love that. Well, what about this year? You move from 1% to like 3%. What would that be like for you? And then... When it comes to change, change reality, you gotta start the plan. Don't just make the plan, start the plan. And get help. We have Financial Peace University here. We've got people who would love to help you with that. Repeat step one. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, rulers, things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt. De depth, not debt, that was interesting depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Last one, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for the blessing. You know, it's okay to expect the blessing when you start this. Here's what I want to challenge you with. If you've never done this or you want to take a step here in this, in this area, or you want to take a next step, maybe, I, I'd love for you to mark it down today just for you. And then I, and then I would love like in a month to see what God did. I'd love it. It'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. Wait for it. You can't, you can't multitask on this one, guys. God's got something better. Father, we ask that you would indeed come and fill us with your spirit. God, I pray that if there are those here who have never trusted you right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give them the ability to say, Jesus, today you are my greater Yes, I trust you as Savior, saving me from my sin and the penalty that I deserve. And I trust you as Lord, I surrender to you. God, help us all. You come down by faith in that way. Oh my goodness, salvation is yours today. God, help us all with our greater yes toward you in these things. In Christ's name, all of God's people said, Amen, amen, amen. Would you stand and we're gonna be dismissed. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace and an increased experience of his grace. Amen and amen. Love you guys.